everybody this morning. Uh, good to see everybody watching on Facebook. Uh, we're going to worship here together in just a second. Just want to remind you of a few of the little housekeeping rules. Don't forget, uh, for song lyrics, you can get on um, our, our Facebook pages and our church app. And I'll be straight up honest, I forgot to put it on our website, so you can't go there today. But you can go on our Facebook page, our Facebook group, or our church app and find song lyrics so you can sing along nice and loud. And uh, also, uh, for those of you that are here in person, uh, we've got communion over on the table. We also have our, our bracelets that we've been using now for uh, our second week. Um, they help communicate what you feel comfortable with. If you need a good six-foot barrier, you can get a red bracelet. If you're good with you know, elbow bumps or like ankle bumps or something like that to say hello, there's yellow. And if you're good with handshakes or whatever you deem okay, green. So they're over there on the table. You can drop those off on your way out and we'll sanitize them just like we did this past week. So just a good way to keep everybody nice and healthy and uh, comfortable with what you're comfortable with. So. Let's pray, and then we'll begin our time of worship together. Father, you are good. We thank you, God, for this beautiful day. We thank you for your, your creation that just shows us that you are all-powerful and you're almighty. We pray, God, that today that we would be able to lift up your name, that your, uh, your, your mighty word would change us from the inside out through the power of your Holy Spirit. We love you, God, and we just look forward to this opportunity. Help us today, Father, to be ready to hear what you have to say. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's worship. Stand up with us as we sing about God's precious blood. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow.
came in. We sang the song uh, for the first time last week. It's such a, um, it's such a beautiful song. Um, in the bridge it says, um, May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, in your family and your children, and their children and their children. So this morning, just think and reflect on the blessings of God as we sing this out today.
Everybody doing? Uh, before we get started, uh, I want to go ahead and give some basic instructions, and that's just that uh, if you haven't collected a communion cup yet, these very cool, neat little packaged communion cups are over here on the table. Uh, you want to grab one of those because we are going to go ahead and get uh, focused in uh, on remembering our Lord. Uh, if you haven't used one of these before, they're really a uh, little confusing, but you got this. I, I think you've, you've got it totally. If you just open the top, I can't do it right now. I'll that, tell you how, it, how good they are. Uh, so if you open the little top thing, you can get that uh, tiny uh, uh, piece of bread. And, uh, and then if you open the next layer down, you can get to the juice. Oh, I got to be. Okay, here we go. We'll go over here. Casually. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, go ahead and get those and kind of get yourself settled. Uh, while we think a little bit about our Lord, uh, I want to ask you guys this morning, have you, have you ever been on the wrong side of a one-sided friendship? <laughs> Anybody ever had that experience? Just me, maybe I'm like the, the, the worst friend. Um, uh, I've been on the wrong side of a one-sided friendship. It's not super fun. Maybe, maybe you haven't had that, but maybe like, uh, you've been on the wrong side of like a one-sided relationship, you know? Maybe, maybe you've had somebody you like, they didn't like you back, you know? Man, that, that hurts, right? I mean, that's no fun. Maybe, maybe you were friends with somebody, but it seemed like they they were always needing you, right? Yeah. But when you needed them, not there, right? I mean, that that hurts. Maybe you know what that feels like to kind of be on the wrong side of that. And if you do, maybe you know a little bit about what Jesus felt like. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows us his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were in the ultimate one-sided friendship. Before any of you cared about him or did anything for him or loved him or showed him any respect at all, he gave you everything. He gave you 100%. He gave you his all. He gave you everything he had, every drop of blood that he could possibly shed. And that's how amazing our Lord is, is that even when he was in a one-sided friendship, he still came after us. And he still pursued us even though we hated him. But thankfully, if you're here this morning, I hope that you came to him. And you came back to your senses. And you returned and you said, I'm sorry, Lord, for always forgetting about you. I'm sorry that I wasn't there. And I wasn't right. And this meal is a reminder of just how much you need him and just how much he loves you. He gave us one simple command and this morning I pray you'll keep it. Remember me. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we are just so amazingly thankful, God, that we didn't deserve this, but you loved us enough to give it to us anyway. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you mostly, Father, for your precious Son, his wonderful, amazing body, Father, that was broken for us, this bread represents. We thank you for that. We thank you God, for uh, that blood that did pour from his veins. Thank you that it was him instead of us. And thank you for giving us that gift. We praise you, God, and give you thanks for this cup that represents that blood. And we pray it all in the name of the most precious, beautiful son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
sent your only son to die for us when we, we did not deserve it. It's so, it's so amazing that the grace that you give us as I'm sinking and I'm overwhelmed by it, I, it fills me up, it gives me joy, it gives me peace. Thank you so much for the sacrifice that your son gave for us. Help us to remember that sacrifice, help us to be thankful, help us to not keep it to ourselves, the joy and the, the hope that we have. Help us to show that love to others so that others may know and others may be filled up with your grace and with your love. Thank you so much for giving us this day to come together and worship and be and, and just worship you. 
Thank you so much, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love to hear uh, our band. I love to hear you guys worship. I know it. I know it's kind of unnerving singing really loud out here because you think everybody's going to hear you, right? You know, I, I kind of pause sometimes. I listen to you guys and I can hear you. And so we've gone from like four months of singing in our houses, and you feel, let's be honest, you feel really weird singing in your house by yourself, don't you? So now we come out here where you feel like everybody's listening to you. You're not sure you want everybody to hear you, but man, don't worry about it. The cool thing is, is like out here, nobody knows exactly where the noise is coming from. So you can just blame it. If everybody turns around and looks at you weird, be like, just point behind you. Like that. That's, that's just a little tip, pro tip I've learned. Anyway, uh, we're going to dismiss our kids now at this time uh, to go with Miss Sherry. And uh, I believe Miss Trisha is going to help out. Uh, going through preschool up through fifth grade. And they can go if uh, they feel comfortable doing that. They're going to have a time for them over here uh, off to back behind us um, while they're taking off uh, we want to always as always invite you to connect um, for those that are watching on Facebook we always want to encourage you as well to send a private message and just say hello in the chat anything like that and if you're here with us today for the first time or the first couple of times it's always good to stop by our welcome table over here on your way out uh, we just want to help you get connected and I cannot make enough pitches about connect groups connect groups officially kick off this monday night we've got groups monday tuesday wednesday thursday and a couple of those days there's more than one group so you've got opportunities galore um i if you're following us on social media hopefully you got a, a saw a link to uh some thoughts that were written by nikki nikki's over there on the steps um she shared some really really cool thoughts we we asked her because we know that she's relatively new been here about a year at movement and she got plugged into a connect group right away. And we asked her to share her thoughts and you'd have thought we paid, right? A paid promotional advertisement, yeah. but yeah. man, it's just good <laughs> stuff. And I encourage you, if you're on the fence, go follow that link off of our social media and read her words. And uh, it, was, it was really, really cool. I, I wanna encourage you to consider it because there's just something about it. Um, I have a guys group that meets on Wednesday nights and we've been primarily meeting on Zoom. We're gonna, for at least for the next little bit, be meeting on Zoom as well, but we got together in person for the first time this past week. And man, it was like, you know, water to a, a desert. I mean, it just was so good to me. Uh, so encouraging just to be able to see each other. And the meetings online have been life giving too. And that's not just preacher talk, that's for real. And so we wanna encourage you to, to check one out. We've got uh, groups for the whole family. We have men's groups, women's groups, and all sorts of things like that. So plenty of opportunities. So uh, also we wanna take a couple moments. Uh, if you've been with us for a while, uh, especially when we're having church online, at the beginning of the pandemic, we talked about Niños de Mexico, the mission we've been supporting for the life of our church, but they had a unique experience. Several years ago, um, I'm going to borrow this mic because I can already tell my voice. Several years ago, they got, um, uh oh. They uh, started being approached by the government. Um, for a long time, the government was skeptical and did not give kids to Nios to Mexico. Uh, but they began to gain their trust. They've been around for 50 plus years. And so several years back, they, the government from time to time would bring children who had no place to go to Nios to Mexico. Well, I believe for the first time in the history of Nios at the beginning of the pandemic, they had three children brought to them by the government of Mexico and they could not accept them. And that was the first time they ever had to do that. And that broke their heart. Um, but the good news is, and that's what I want to share with you today. The good news is, is just this past week, I believe, or a couple of weeks ago, they were able to accept those three kids into Niños de Mexico. It's a sibling group of, I believe, two boys and a girl, maybe. Uh, and they were able to have them take them in. And just in case you don't know, Niños, uh, we took our first mission trip down there last summer. I uh, hope to go back in another year or so. They are a, a really powerful ministry that trains up young people to first off love Jesus and gives them a home that where they are loved and accepted and treated uh, with respect as human beings. And then trains them to be good citizens of the kingdom and good citizens of Mexico. And it's really a, a powerful ministry. And so there's three more kids out of the hundreds and even thousands of kids over the years that have been trained up in the, the way of Jesus Christ and how to be good people. And so you guys, your generosity does that. And so when you give it movement, it literally, literally changes lives. I cannot say that enough. And so you can give online at movementchristianchurch.com. You can give on our church app. You can give here in person as well. Um, and uh, from time to time, I always like to share 
Uh, some people like to mail in uh, their, their offering, and you can send that to, I know this, you probably won't remember this, but I'll just share it anyway. P.O. Box 1135, Nightdale, North Carolina, so if you want to do that. Um, we are beginning a new series. We are beginning a new series uh, in the book of Colossians, all right? Colossians, I feel like I'm being attacked. <laughs> the scene keeps like bobbing at me. Can y'all see that? It's yeah. yeah, it's on an angle. I'm, I'm still on the angle. starting Colossians. Colossians is one of my favorite books, and it's a really powerful book, and the series we're calling is called Full. F-U-L-L, -L, Full. Because how, how often have you ever felt empty in your life? Felt empty. You know, it's, it's a struggle for most of us. At some point in our life, we feel empty. We try to fill our lives with all the wrong things. Um, it, it's, a, it's a deadly, dangerous thing to try to fill your life with something that's only going to drain you and leave you more empty. I got a question to kind of ask you to get you thinking a little bit. Are people happier to see you coming or to see you going? That's something to think about. Are people happier to see you coming or to see you going? You know, and maybe, maybe you don't want to answer that about yourself, but here, think about this. We all have people in our lives, right? We all have people in our lives that are a little bit draining. Can we admit that? Are y'all going to lie to me straight to my face? <laughs> we, we all do. You know, everybody on Facebook, you know, you've got somebody, you probably had somebody pop in your brain that's just sort of draining to you. And it can be for different reasons. Maybe maybe they're just sort of negative. Maybe they're like, uh, y'all remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? You know, maybe they're like Eeyore. Oh, well, it's not much of a tale, but it's all a tale. You know, you know, maybe that's what they are. They're super negative, possibly. Um, maybe they just, you know, they're draining. They take a lot from you emotionally, and they don't give back. Kind of like the one-sided relationship that, that Mike was talking about during his communion thought. Um, maybe they just complain a lot, and, you know, it's a struggle. But I will go ahead and give you a, a pro-life tip right here. If you can't think of someone, you're probably somebody else's someone. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that. That's not nice, is it? But, you know, there's a chance that we might be draining to somebody. There's a chance that we might uh, have that person. And we all need somebody that we can kind of just, you know, just pour out on, right? But hopefully we're that for them as well. We give them, we're, we're their person that they can just share everything with. But here's the thing. The Apostle Paul was so grateful for the church at Colossae. Colossae was this little town in what's called Asia Minor, kind of in the realm of what we might think of as Turkey nowadays, you know, sort of there, a little bit Middle Eastern, but on the Asian continent, and it was this town that was pretty powerful, and one thing that's interesting is the Apostle Paul did not start this church. You know, as you read through in the New Testament, there's a lot of churches that it seems like Paul had a hand, had a hand in starting, but that was not the case with Colossae, but nevertheless, he was grateful for this church. And so I want to ask a question to kind of get us started in Colossians chapter 1. If you've got your Bibles, turn there. Colossians 1. Does your faith inspire gratitude in others? Are they happy to see you coming instead of happy to see you go? Does your faith inspire gratitude in others? Do they recognize your faith? And think about it this way. What makes your faith something to be thankful for? Now, a little bit of a play on words. Thankful means to be full of thanks. But we're putting an extra L on the end, right? Because we're talking about being full all through the book of Colossians. So is your faith something that people are thankful for, that leaves them full of thanks that you were there and that you're living your life? Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Let's read along. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So Paul introduces himself, you know, their letters were a little bit different. You know, if, if, does anybody remember what a letter is? This stuff called paper that we used to write on with a pen and ink, you know, instead of typing. You know, you would write your letter at the beginning. You normally would write who it's to, correct? But now, you know, the way it was in this Bible times is many times the, the part where you say who it's from was at the beginning and that type of thing. So Paul's saying, look, this is who the letter's from. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he's writing the letter to, right here, the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. Now, I want to point out something really quick right there. It, it's valuable, but it, it's small, but it's so valuable. He writes to the saints. 
Now, automatically, most of us, when you hear the word saint, you think of somebody who's like really high and mighty, got it all figured out, knows all the answers, right? But that's not what a saint is. A saint is someone who has been sanctified, made holy by the Holy Spirit. Anybody who's a believer in Jesus, anybody who's a follower of Christ, who surrendered themselves to the gospel, is a saint. And it's not somebody who's got it perfect. It's not somebody who's done posthumous miracles and all this other stuff. A saint is somebody who is washed by the blood of the Lamb. And I hope that encourages you a little bit to help you realize, you know, that you have something to be thankful for and that other people can be thankful for you. And he goes on and he makes another clarification. He says, to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Faithful people are who bring us encouragement. And so that's the first idea. People are thankful for visible faith and love. Now, if you've been here for the past several weeks, you've kind of heard this lesson. But I believe that this is a lesson that we as a church need to be reminded of time in and time out. Because we forget that love is not just an emotion. And so you might think I'll beat a dead horse when I talk about this. But man, until I get it, until we all get it, I think we've got to be reminded of these things. Love is more than just a thought, more than just an emotion. And the way the world describes it nowadays is you fall in and out of love. And then, okay, the relationship's over. But love, as you see it in Scripture, is a decision to think and do the best for someone else. It's sacrifice. Jesus is the ultimate example of love. And yes, he's perfect and he had the right thoughts about us. But his love was shown by going to the cross to die for our sins. You know? And the same definition is the same for us in love. And so what makes somebody thankful for your faith? It's love that's visible and faith that's visible. Look at verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Go with me down a rabbit trail for just a second. All right? He says, since we heard of your faith and your love for all the saints. If they were just thinking good thoughts about their believer friends, their brothers and sisters in Christ, was that something you would hear of? No, you have to at least tell somebody, but more importantly, you have to what? Show somebody that you love them. Same thing with your faith. You can believe lots of good things about God, but until you act on it, can anybody see your faith and see the evidence of your faith? No. The Bible really speaks clearly that that faith, biblical faith, is so much more than just head knowledge. It's so much more than just the acceptance of a truth. Because here's something that's so powerful in the book of James. It says that even the demons, what? Believe in God. Now, the God is understood. It's not in the text, so don't, don't stone me yet, right? All right? I'm being clear about that. But it says even the demons believe in God and shudder. So demons have head knowledge. They actually, it's not even faith for them. They know beyond a shadow of a doubt, but they believe in God, but yet they do not obey him. Demons are not going to be saved. Demons are not washed by the blood of the lamb. And so you and I can have head knowledge of God, but if it doesn't come out in the way we live, in the way that we love, then we're not truly being faithful to Jesus. We're not loving people in Jesus' name. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love for you have for all the saints... Now I'll ask this one more way just to make sure we're all on the same page. Can people see your feelings? They can see the, the effect of your feelings. If you're sad, they might see what? Tears. Anybody else an a, a angry, sad person? When you get sad, you get angry. Anybody else like that? Yeah. I'm the only weirdo like that. <laughs> but they can see the effect of your feelings and your emotions, but they can't see your feelings and your emotions. I mean, there's some people that have what we call a good poker face, right? You know, they you don't know what's going on on the inside. They've got all kinds of feelings and emotions, but they, you won't see that unless they act it out, unless they show you their feelings, whether they be good or bad feelings. You know, um, it, it's pretty, pretty honest, you know. Um, you know, I tell my story about Sherry and I all the time, probably too much, you know, but Hey, like I told her, that's her punishment for breaking up with me on my birthday. She gave me the best sermon illustration known to man. And so that's just, you know, if there's a such thing as penance, that's probably hers. Or being married to me might be just as bad. Anyway, but when I was trying to woo her, right, you know, when you're in that stage, you're trying to get that girl's attention or, you know, that lady's trying to get that guy's attention. She wants to talk to him. You know, back in those dating days or even pre-dating days, 
I had to show her how I felt. If every time I walked by her on the campus of what was in Run Up Bible College, I ignored her, you think she'd get the idea that I liked it? No, I had to show her the way that I felt. And, you know, I was very smooth. Y'all you know, have no doubt about that. That's just understood, right? I didn't have to tell you that. But she had to know how I felt, not by the, it just staying in my brain, but I had to show her. I had to tell her. I had to act on it. And it's the same thing with faith and love. People can't see your belief. They can't see your warm feelings about them. That's why it's so important. And I hope and pray if we haven't learned anything else from this whole quarantine time, from this whole, you know, COVID-19 pandemic is that life is short, you know, and life is short. And it seems like there's been tragedy after tragedy, even not related to the pandemic. But this whole year has shown us that you need to let people know how you feel. You need to share your faith with people. See, the truth is, is that people see your faithful obedience and they see your sacrificial acts of love. If they stay in your head, they stay in your heart, they'll never know. So they need to see that. That's what makes them thankful for your faith. Second thing is this. People are thankful for a hope-centered life. People are thankful for a hope-centered life. Look at verse 5. It says, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. So here's a couple things to think about. Are you focused on heaven instead of earth? If you want hope, then you have to be focused on heaven rather than earth. Hope is something that literally changes lives. It keeps people alive. If someone does not have hope and they're going through a difficult time, they can easily just physically give up and die. They can die on the inside. They can die physically. They can die emotionally, mentally. But hope is what keeps us going. And if, the, if there's a truth that we can wrap our minds around today, it's this. This world right now is so hopeless. This world is so hopeless, and that's why we're seeing the things going on. That's why we're seeing people being hurtful and hateful to the neighbors around them because they don't have hope. And so if we, the church, make sure that we have our hope grounded in, in heaven and in the scripture, then our hope can overflow to other people, and that's what this world needs. When they see a life of hope, when other people see a life of hope, it gets their attention. One of uh, a guy I really like to listen to to preach is a guy named John Weeks and he's a preacher out in Kentucky and he has some good messages from time to time but I remember many years ago I saw him speak and he had a video it was like one of those incognito videos that he did and he would just go out downtown um, I believe Lexington Kentucky I always get it confused he would go down to Lexington Kentucky where he was from preached at a church there and he would just hold up a sign now you've seen a lot of people doing it but he was one of the first people I ever saw do it but a sign that simply said free hugs and he would stand out there in the busy business district of, of Lexington, Kentucky, sometimes in rough neighborhoods, and he would just stand out there and just give anybody that was willing to have a hug a hug. And there was this one time he showed this clip, and he's a really humble guy. He's not, he doesn't seem to me as one of those braggadocious guys, but I'm glad he showed this clip. There was a woman that comes up, and he tells you the backstory. He's sitting there, he's holding this sign, and she's on a bike, and she looks, she looks kind of rough. She, you know, she'd had a rough life. And she's on her bike, and she stops, and she looks at the sign, and she kind of looks at it, and you can see the puzzled look on her face. And she says, what does it say? Two words. She didn't know what it said. He said it says free hugs. He said, if you'd like a hug, I'd be glad to give you a hug. And she was kind of like, you just saw it. I mean, it, she was just wrestling with it. And so she gets off her bike. She inches closer to him, holds out her arms, and so he holds out his arms to her, and she just dives in. <laughs> he saw her face just kind of melt. <laughs> this was a woman that probably had not had much physical touch that was of any good or value. Chances are the physical touch that she had had was from people that were using her and abusing her, and it may have been years it may have been years that she had had anybody just want to hug her just to show her love as a human being. And she just, I mean, just held on to him for moments. It seemed like forever. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that's what this world needs. There's so many people like that woman who have no hope. And they, they, they hurt themselves. They hurt others. They lash out. And they need hope. And so they need the church 
to show living hope. And hope is only found in the gospel, church. It's only found in the gospel. You can have momentary moments of happiness and joy, but only true hope and joy, only it only comes from the gospel. The good news that Jesus died for you and me and lives again, and that you and I can live again too. People want that life-changing hope, and they need to see it lived out. And so I want to challenge you, if nothing else, if nothing else today, when we leave here, let's look in our, our mirrors, so to speak. You know, maybe it needs to be the physical mirror, but it definitely needs to be the mirror of the Word of God and say, does my life radiate hope? And if not, what do I need to do to make sure it does? Because this world needs hope. Here's the third thing. People are thankful for a contagious and a growing faith. If you want people to be thankful to see you coming rather than happy to see you go, try to have a contagious and a growing faith. Look at verse 6. I know this is disjointed, but let's read verse 5 just to give us a little bit of a background. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, verse 6, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned from Epaphras, our fellow, beloved fellow servant, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we have heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, the asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Now listen to this. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So there's a few things real quick I want us to get over on this. So many of us, we take the first steps and surrender to Jesus, and then we never grow. I, I've been there in my life. I took the first step, and that was truly my life. I took the first step of surrendering my life to Jesus. I was kind of older for somebody who had grown up in the church. But really quickly, I just came up out of the, the waters of baptism, and it's like I plan on going to dry off in hell. It's kind of the way I live my life, you know? I, I, I just did not try to grow. And it really quickly, my faith just was spiraling downward. It was like what I had done, I, I was not living it. And so the question that you ask, based on what Paul says to the church at Colossae, are you bearing fruit? Am I bearing fruit in my life? Now, the first place that we can bear fruit is in winning other people to Jesus. I believe that's one of the, the greatest things we need to try to do. But it also can be how much we grow and also how much we help other people grow. It's important for us to help our brothers and sisters grow in Christ. It's important for us to plant seeds of the gospel or water seeds of the gospel that, as we talked about, I believe, last week, we may not be there when the harvest takes place, but just because we're not leading someone to obey the gospel doesn't mean that we're not valuable to it. But there needs to be fruit in our lives. Are we seeing any fruit in our life? Are we encouraging others? He talks about it increasing. I'm going to ask a really tough question. Who have you led to Christ? Or who have you led closer to Christ? That may seem intense. That may seem like that is completely out of my wheelhouse as you're thinking about it. But every single one of us are called to point people to Jesus and help them move a little bit closer to Jesus. So that's a question that you and I need to ask ourselves honestly. Who have I led to Christ or who have I led closer to him? Whether it be somebody who hasn't yet obeyed the gospel or somebody who's a, a fellow believer. Who am I leading closer to Jesus? question we also can ask is this. Are you filled with the knowledge of God's will? That's what Paul said in that lengthy passage of scripture. Are you filled with the knowledge of God's will? Or is your Bible just something that sits on a coffee table? Or it's an app that hardly goes unused so much that your iPhone will permanent, you know, temporarily delete it for you. <laughs> that ever happen? You know, iPhones will do that. You know, they'll they'll kind of put apps to the side if you're not using them very much. Is that what we're doing? Are we filling our minds and our hearts with the Word of God? Are we longing for spiritual wisdom and understanding? The thing that I struggle with from time to time is I want knowledge. I want depth of scripture. But my Bible stays like this. You know, I've got the answers. I've got the opportunity. 
But you know, you just, we don't take it. A friend of mine back in my days that I wasn't like so, so much of a Christian, if somebody was running their mouth to him, he would say something like this. He'd be like, there ain't nothing between you and me but air and an opportunity. <laughs> You say, let's go ahead. We can fight if you want to. And what I'm saying to you is there's nothing between you and your Bible but air and opportunity. Pick it up. Open it up. And, and even if it's just a verse, read that verse. Pray over that verse. Read it two times. Read it ten times if you need to. Or if you if you can stay focused, read a whole chapter. Read, you know, whatever. But read the Word of God because we're called to be filled with spiritual wisdom. And that's what makes uh, people thankful for us. He goes on and he says, are you walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? That's what Paul challenges them. He said, I'm grateful that you're doing that. You're walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Are we doing the same thing? I got a lot of tough questions today, and I'm, I'm wrestling with them as I was writing them. If your children, or anybody, any adult, anybody else, never heard a word you said, but followed and copied your actions and your choices, would they be closer to God or farther away from God? If they never heard a word you said, and they just copied what you did and your choices in life, would they be closer to God or further away? We've got to realize that people are looking at us every single day. People are watching what we do. Are we walking in a manner worthy of the Lord that helps people get closer to God? And I want to do something because this is what Paul did. He started off this little section talking about bearing fruit. And what does he do at the end of this little section? He talks about what? Bearing fruit. Do you think he's going to give us a pass on not bearing fruit? No. He's saying, are you bearing fruit? And the question you and I have to answer is, are we bearing fruit and increasing in our knowledge? He repeats it. To use our movement lingo, are you moving? Our mission statement is to love, serve, and move. We love God and love people. We serve other people in Jesus' name, the church and the world. And then we make it our goal to move closer to God. When we stumble and fall, we get back up and we help each other get back up and keep moving towards the prize of Christ Jesus. Are you moving and growing? And I, I would be a bad preacher if I did not say connect groups. Connect groups. I mean, this is a way that you can continue to move and grow closer and deeper in the Word of God. Sign up. So does your faith look growing or does it look like it's dying? And then the last question I want to get you to think about, the last challenge I should say is this. People are thankful for an enduring faith. An enduring faith. Look at the, the text, verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I gotta be honest. In my 20 plus years of trying to follow Jesus faithfully in, in my life of ministry, there's probably nothing that has discouraged me more over those years than people who walked away from the church. I'm being honest, that's, that's the case. And it hits me even harder because there were a lot of times early on in my, my life of faith that I was that discouragement for somebody else. Before I got serious about my faith, um, I claimed to be a Christian, but I, I, I showed no signs of it. I was not growing. I was not moving. I was not somebody that you would follow and be closer to God. And I think about the heartbreak that I caused so many other people and the discouragement because I was supposed to be a part of the family, but I was never around. And that's one of the things that we have to realize is that people are thankful for an enduring faith that lasts, a faith that is able to stand up to the challenges that come our way. I'll be really honest, I, I still feel pain for some of the people who walked away from the church 20 years ago. I still think about it from time to time, and it breaks my heart. Because we need each other. 
We are the body, and I don't care who you are, modern medicine is pretty good, but losing a body part is serious stuff. No matter how small and insignificant you may think that body part is, losing a body part is serious stuff. But when somebody keeps the faith in difficult circumstances, man, that just fires you up, doesn't it? I mean, it absolutely fires you up. And you're like, man, if they can put up with that, if they can deal with that, then I can do it too. And you don't know how many tens or hundreds of people are watching and, and learning the same thing. If they can deal with that situation and still give glory to God, man, I can do it too. And so that's why we need to have an enduring faith that holds on in strength and in power in Jesus' name. So when we strengthen our faith and we lean on Jesus' strength, we can encourage others. Just recently for school, uh, we gave Luke as one of his reading assignments a book called Three Gates of Splendor. Several years back now, it became really uh, popular through a movie called End of the Spear. It's a true story based on missionaries who went down to Ecuador and tried to reach an unreached people group uh, at that time called the Aka Indians. And they were very warlike and, I mean, just they, the different branches of the same group of people would just fight each other all the time, the different little tribes. And they would just kill each other. And, I mean, they believed in revenge big time. But they tried to drop them gifts and little things and give them supplies and they used an airplane and they finally got the courage to land. They felt like the reception was good enough. They get down there and they have some good interaction with some of the people and they feel like everything's going well. But then all of a sudden, because these people were so treacherous and they didn't trust anybody, and they'd had some bad experiences with outsiders, but they always were looking to make sure they didn't get got. They just turned and started spearing these five men to death. All their families were back at their base camp, and they finally got word that these men had been murdered in cold blood. And the interesting thing was almost every single one of them had a, a pistol on their side, but they never used it. And as the story goes on, and it's told from the perspective of some of the people, uh, Minkaye was one of the, the leaders of the band of people that killed these five missionaries, but then later on was led to Christ from the wives and the children of these men that they murdered. They didn't give up on them. But you know what made the difference? It was so valuable for those women and, and other missionaries to come back and still love them. But you know what made the difference? And it's pointed out a couple of times in the movie, The End of the Spear. One of the women that was involved in, in helping them get set up to be killed. And one of the men who helped murder them. At different points, they cried out, they didn't shoot us. They knew what those guns would have done. And they knew that those guns would have ended the whole fight. But they cried out and almost like in a, they were wrestling on the inside and they said, they didn't shoot us. They didn't shoot us. And what we have to realize is that a faith that can stand there and take the destruction of themselves and take the put downs and take the hate and the anger, that kind of faith is what changes lives for eternity. And just a few, a uh, couple months ago, I shared the story of Minkaye, one of the main leaders of the group that murdered those men. He became so much, not just a part of the church, but a part of the family of the man that he murdered, Nate Saint, that they called him Grandfather Minkaye, and he just died just a few months ago. He called, they called him Grandfather, and he was their family. Faith that changes this world is faith that can stand up even in the most difficult times. And I'm about, I'm about done here. But I want you to know this. I know that it takes strong faith to stand in this world and be different. Right now, people are just yelling and screaming at each other for all kinds of different reasons, not realizing that there's another human being that they're screaming at. And so it takes a lot of faith to stand strong and be different. But thankfully, you and I don't have to stand in our own strength. You don't have to do it alone. You can ground yourself in God's strength. You can know that you're forgiven in Christ. And it doesn't matter what the enemy says. It doesn't matter what the enemy says. You're no longer, as, as Paul said, you're no longer in the domain of darkness. 
but you're a part of the kingdom of light. And so when you decide to take a stand, it's like, man, here we go. And you can almost like feel the Holy Spirit, the presence of God just browning you and holding you up. And it may be like it's just you, just barely, you're just almost like a body that's there. But the Holy Spirit will hold you up in the church when we're together, will hold you up. But that's what this world needs if they're going to be thankful and grateful for what the faith that we have is we've got to stand strong even when nobody else will. But praise be to God. Praise be to God. And he took us out of the kingdom of darkness and of shadows. He put us in the kingdom of light through the blood of his son, Jesus. So we're going to sing our last song. And I want to challenge you. The world needs the church to stand up and live a life of faith that will leave them thankful. More than ever. And one thing that might be a little bit encouraging, might be a little scary, is that all it takes is a little bit of faith to make a big difference in this world right now. <laughs> Just being a little bit different will go a long way right now because it seems like this world is so dark and so hopeless. So what do you need to do? What do you need to do? What boundary, what barrier do you need to move out of your way or say, God, move it out of my way for me because I can't do it? What area of your life, maybe it's just simply saying every day I'm going to spend some time in God's word. I'm going to spend some time praying. I'm going to start telling one person I can about my faith each week. I'm just going to look for an opportunity to, to share my faith. I'm going to try to encourage one brother or sister in Christ, even if it's just a text message. I'm going to buy them lunch every now and then. I'm going to do something. I'm going to encourage somebody. I'm going to point people closer to Jesus. But the church, we need each other if we're going to make a difference in this kingdom of darkness that surrounds us. But you don't have to do it on your own. You got the church. And you got the one who paid for the church with his body and his blood, Jesus. And that's really powerful. So we just want to ask you to consider... If you haven't surrendered to that power, then let's do that today. There's nothing better than to see somebody surrender to Jesus, be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because of their faith in Jesus and their willingness to leave their old life behind and confess Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Call on His name. He does all the work. You can have that new life today. Or maybe you need to say, I've done that. I need to take a stand don't leave you without taking a stand because I'm here to tell you this is the easiest place for everybody that's watching online. Right here as we gather together is the easiest place to take a stand. What's more difficult is to take a stand here and leave here. But if you stand here first, I hope you stand that much more here. I'll be right over here this side. The sing is worship the king. He took the stand for us first.
things we wanted to do today, uh, as I look around, I, I think a lot of the people that fit in these categories are not here with us today for different reasons, but what we want to do is take a couple moments and we want to honor uh, first responders. So that means anyone who's a police or firefighter, uh, nurse, doctor, works in the medical field like that, uh, just for the proximity of 9-11 and, and remembering that tragic time in the history of our country and for what people like you do, but also now with this pandemic stuff, the people that have been on the front lines in that way. Um, if there's somebody that fits in that category today, would you mind just standing up for us? If you're online, you stand up in your house and we'll know. <laughs> um, we know we've got quite a few people in our church family that fit in that category, and so we would definitely, we've got a little gift that we want to give them. Uh, and for anybody who's watching online, just send us a message if you fit in that category as well. We'll make sure you get uh, a little thank you as well. But we do want to be grateful for the people that help us uh, just stay protected and safe and just do so many things that a lot of times go just unappreciated. So we're, we're grateful for that. And one of the ways that you guys can help continue that thing is tonight. Uh, tonight at 5 o'clock, we're going to meet out at Nightingale Station Park right across from Prime Barbecue by the big uh, pavilion on the corner of that parking lot. And then we're going to divide up into a couple of groups and go and give out some little thank yous to uh, the police stations and fire stations right here around Nightdale. So we'd love to have your support in that just to show people, hey, we're, we're supporting you, we're behind you in this. As many people as we can get to do that would be a great thing. To meet out at 5 o'clock tonight, you can uh, ask Laura at the table for details or you can sign up on her app and let us know you're coming so we know whether to wait for you or not. We want to continue that. Thanks. But we do say thank you to anybody and everybody. Uh, who serves in that way. We're really grateful for you guys. So let's give them a, a big round of hands. Uh, don't forget, of course, tonight, 5 o'clock, but then also uh, Connect Group's kicking off this week. Make sure you get plugged in and find one for you. So let's stand and we'll pray and be dismissed. Lord, we love you, and we're grateful. Uh, we're grateful, Father, that you sent Jesus to die for us when we didn't deserve it. And Father, I pray that we would leave other people grateful for the faith that we live. Lord, we're not perfect, but we know that that's why there's grace. So I pray God would be strengthened and encouraged and built up in our faith, and we do the same thing for other people, so that people would see the hope that we have, and they want to know what uh, that hope stems from, and that's from you. So we can point as many people as possible to Jesus. That's what our purpose is in life. That's what our goal is, and I pray, Father, you help us be successful in that. We love you, God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And have a great day.